everybody. Welcome to those of you who are in the room, those of you who are watching online. We're going to sing together and celebrate our King of Glory, who is worthy of our song and worthy of our praise. Would you join in? Would you stand and sing? Here we go.
Welcome, everybody. Welcome for those of you who are in the room and those of you who are watching online. I want to say it's great to be with you. My name is Jason Martin. I'm the worship pastor here. I want to let you know about a few things coming up in the life of our church. But before we do, let's pray together. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and to worship your name, to lift up our praises to you. For you are a God who is worthy of our song. You are a God who is worthy of our worship. And we bring our praises to you now. From wherever we are in this place or wherever we're watching the service here today, I pray, God, that you would be glorified in our song, that you would be blessed by our praises, that your spirit would work in our hearts and draw us to yourself, that you would help us to prepare the way for you as you prepare the way for us in worship. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here in the room, you may be seated. If you're watching online, you may be seated as well. I assume you were standing up in your living room, wherever you're watching, singing together. It is so great to be worshiping with you. It's so great to be uh, thinking about what God's doing in the life of our church. And as we continue to meet and worship and look into the scriptures, we our desire is that God's spirit would continue to be in this place. And with you wherever you are. I want to mention a few things coming up as you received uh, pathway notes and there's pathway notes online as well about things coming up in the life of our church. We have a few things that I want to draw your attention to. We have some Bible studies coming up for men and women. We currently have a men's Bible study happening on Wednesday mornings if you're interested in that. Uh, You'll find more information in your pathway notes. And we also have some Bible studies kicking off on January 31st. Our men's study is kicking off on uh, Tuesday night, January 31st. And our women's study is kicking off uh, Tuesday morning and Tuesday evening. It's a separate study. Uh, The women's study is happening Tuesday morning, Tuesday night. But also there's a Zoom option on Wednesday evening as well. Again, you'll find all that information in your pathway notes. But we'd love for you to check that out if you're interested in going a little bit deeper in some of uh, your study in the scriptures. Also want to mention some of our care groups, our divorce care and our grief share ministries are happening uh, starting on February 20th. And if you're in a position in your life where you'd like some assistance, whether you're going through a a season of divorce or you've been divorced and you'd like to be with some people who are like-minded, who want to encourage you, I encourage you to, uh, to check out that Uh, class. And I also want to encourage those of you who are going through uh, times of discouragement and times of loss. Uh, Maybe you've lost someone in your family or lost a relative and you want to be with those who have gone down the same road that you have and experienced the same thing that you have. Grief Share is an important class, an important group of people that you can be a part of. So please check out both of those support groups. Also want to mention if you're new with us, again, here in the room or watching online, please let us know that you're watching and let us know by checking out that connect card. You can fill that out and let us know that you're here with us. Also, if you have anything you'd like prayer, you can put that on the connect card and there will be people praying for you this week. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to know what's going on in your life so we can support you. If you're here in the service today, I want to encourage you to check out our information table as you walk out these doors, and we'd love to have an opportunity to say hello to you if you're new at our Welcome Center. We'd love to give you a free gift and say uh, thank you for coming, because we do appreciate you taking time out of your week to be here today. Well, this, uh, this weekend, we continue our Mark teaching series called Follow, and hopefully as you came in, if you did not already receive one last weekend, uh, you got that sermon journal. We'd love for you to have one of those. If you don't already have one, when we greet one another in just a moment, you can head out these doors to the information table and grab one. It's going to be a great resource for you as we go through the book of Mark together and study the gospel. And, and it's a great, great resource because there's a scripture on one side and on the other side is a great place to take notes. And uh, we'll be doing that today. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're going to continue in our worship. Uh, we're going to look at... Um, in the, in the message in a bit, we're going to look at uh, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. And we think about Jesus uh, as he died for us and rose again as a, as a picture of baptism. We go down in the water and rise again. But sometimes we, uh, sometimes we forget that Jesus was actually baptized himself by John the Baptist. We're going to look at that. And so when we come out of our greeting time together, we're going to sing Beneath the Waters. And I encourage you to think about how Jesus has gone before you in many ways, and one of those ways is being baptized in the waters, and I encourage you to think about that as we worship him. Well, before we do, take a moment, stand up, say hello to those around you, and we'll sing together. Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, you are so good. You are so good and so worthy of all of our worship. Thank you that you are a faithful God who did just as he promised. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to make a way for us, Father. We are so in need of you. And we surrender our hearts here to you fully and to the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, we thank you that in Christ, in Jesus, we are a new creation. We are made new. You're so good. Father, we ask that you continue to do a good work in our hearts that we might um, be good witnesses for your greater glory, Father. We love you, and we ask that everything we do here, from our songs, from our message, from our interactions together, from the relationships that we build here together, would bring you glory and would draw people closer to you. Father, have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, everybody. It is great to see you. Good to be together. Let me add my welcome to those that you've received from others here today. Very excited to take us back into the Gospel of Mark for just our second week in our series, Follow. And I welcome all of you who are present in the room. Welcome those of you who are watching online and those in the classic venue and on the Moon campus. It's just a privilege to be together even though in different places, being united in what we're studying, in what Jesus is teaching us in these days and in these weeks. So welcome everybody. As I was thinking about it this week, I got to thinking about essentials and really what is essential to life. And it sort of prompted me to get stirring in some of my thoughts. I mean, what, what is it, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, what is it that makes you, you, right? What are the essentials to who you are? I got thinking about it for me and some different ones popped to my mind and I've actually got some of them right here. I thought that I would share some of the things that kind of make, that make me, me. This is one of them right here, recent driver's license for me. This has some essential information about who I am. Uh, it's got my full name on here. It's got my address. It's got my date of birth. It has my motorcycle endorsement. Unfortunately, there's no motorcycle that goes along with that, but at least I have the license for it should that ever, should that ever happen. It's got my uh, eye color. It's got my height. You know, I went looking at this, and I was kind of surprised to see it because I thought it was always on there, but apparently your license doesn't have your weight on it. And I figured out why that was. Everybody lies, you know? So unless there's a scale at the DMV, we wouldn't even know that. This is my pirate's hat. This is also essential to who I am because I am a Pirates fan. I do root for the Pirates. I've been rooting for them ever since we moved to Pennsylvania, which has been 24 years now. And even though 20 of those years, they've had losing seasons. But I've, st I've continued to root for them. I used to root for the Cubs before the Pirates. The Cubs went 108 years between World Series victories. And so I thought, you know, it must just be me. I've got some, some you know, bad luck when it comes to choosing my, choosing my sports teams. And, and then I thought, well, maybe it's me, which is why they're bad. I get emails now from major league franchises telling me, don't root for us. But anyway, so that's, uh, that's some of that. Um, where we vacation is also very important to me. Now, I don't have a souvenir for that, but I do have a, a picture of where we go. On the screen, yeah, that's, that's our, probably our favorite vacation spot. Um, so we've got that. This is actually my uh, Kenya uh, Maasai shield. It reminds me of the many different trips that we have taken there. I've actually been taking people on mission trips to Kenya since 1992. That's 30 years plus, and it's one of the most exciting things that I do. It's, 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 it's ingrained in me. It's part, of, it's part of who I am to have the opportunity to engage with uh, those folks and engage other people in that as, as well. So that's something that's an essential. Or I think also about uh, this. This is one of my marathon medals. In fact, this was my very first marathon medal, and uh, marathons have become kind of an essential for me, especially over the last decade. It's something that I think about and I do a lot, and it means a lot 
to me. Now, those are important, but there are some that I think of that even surpass those. And when I really think about what is essential Jeff, I, it's a much shorter list. It's a much shorter list. It includes things like this. This is, it's probably kind of hard to see where you are. This is a picture of my family. It's got myself and Carolyn and our two daughters and my son-in-law on a, on a trip that we enjoyed together not all that long ago. And this means everything to me. My family means everything to me. And I cannot imagine life without them. Or another of the absolute essentials when it comes to who I see myself to be is so essential that, that I actually wear the symbol of that on my body every single day. Of course, it's my wedding ring symbolizing my marriage to Carolyn. And as I think about that, I can't imagine any greater blessing that there could possibly be in my life than being able to share it with her and navigate this life together. It means everything. There is no greater human joy to me than being in relationship with Carolyn. And of course, also when I think about absolute essentials, I think about my faith and who I really am inside. I think about my faith and about the word of God and what it means to me. This is actually a Bible that was given to me when I passed pastor instruction class at the age of 12. And I've hung on to it, and it means a lot to me because it symbolizes what ultimately I ended up doing with my life. It symbolizes God's word and, and my love for it. It symbolizes to me my call to ministry and the opportunity that I have to do what I do, to preach God's word and to be pastor of a church just like this one. It means everything to me. That is, especially those last ones, that is the essential Jeff. I mean, who I really am. And I get to thinking about that because today I want to think with you about somebody else and the essentials of their life. And maybe boiling it down to some, some common root denominators if we can. It's what the passage we're going to be looking at today tells us about. And I would love for you to turn there. It's Mark chapter 1, and we're going to be in verses 9 to 13 today. And uh, go ahead and open up in your journal. Hope you have that with you. If, you. if you're in the room and you don't have that, you can get one out in the lobby. We'd love for you to have that as we get into this. You can jot your notes down in there. Mark chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Get there in your journal, in your Bible, however you want to access that. There's an outline for you there in the pathway notes as well. We're going to be thinking today about the essential Jesus. The essential Jesus. And when I think about the essential Jesus, it really boils down to just two things. <clears throat> I think it boils down to two absolute essentials. And if we fail to understand these two things, if we fail to understand the significance of these two things, we are not going to understand Jesus. We will not understand salvation. We will not understand substitutionary atonement or basically Jesus taking our place or so many other things that are central to who Jesus is and what he came to do. But if we can understand these two, then all of those things are going to come to life for us. It's that important. Those things are going, that understanding is going to help us to follow Jesus, which of course is what we are thinking about in this series. So let's talk about the essential Jesus. Let's talk about these two absolute keys that I think that we can boil it down to that are that urgently essential to understand. Two main ideas that come clear in this text. The first of them is this, that Jesus is like us. Jesus is like us. In Mark's characteristic, get to the point style, he just very briefly says, oh, there's this guy, Jesus, and then bang, in the next verse, he's like, Jesus is there. Jesus is on the scene. We start to read of it here in our passage. Verse nine of Mark chapter one says this. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
Jesus, at this point, has lived on earth about 30 years. You have a little outline here, or a little timeline, rather, for you to help understand. As this opens up, as, ba- as Jesus is baptized, it's the beginning of his ministry. He does three years of ministry before the crucifixion. But really, there's so much of his life that we don't know about that we haven't been told anything about. We know a good bit about his birth at the beginning. We read of that in Matthew and in Luke's gospel. It tells about him about coming and about the shepherds and the angels and, and all of that stuff, all the way up to the Magi. And so we're probably looking maybe upwards of 18 months, maybe two years that we know about Jesus' life. Then things go silent. We don't know anything of what is happening in Jesus' life until this moment at age 12, he shows up in Jerusalem, there at the temple with his parents. After that, there's this long stretch until the age of about 30 where we don't know anything else really in that. At age 12, though, he shows up, and some of you might uh, remember that account. Basically, his parents lose him, right? He's there, he's, he's wrapped up in what's going on in the temple, and they leave town without him, and they're like, I thought you had him. And like, no, you said you were gonna get, right? Now, before we get... Uh, you know, we look down on them or judge them too much. I can remember the time a little while back now, but uh, I called up a pathway person. This is on a Sunday afternoon, about one o'clock in the afternoon, and I said, hey, you gonna come back and get your preschooler? They'd left without their preschooler, and they'd gone home, and the dad said, do we have an option? <laughs> and, and I'm like, no, you gotta get back here. And that's not the only time that it has happened. At Pathway, you know who you are. And it's, it's happened multiple times, actually. Somebody's forgotten their child. Well, that, that happened to Jesus here. And, uh, and so, but after that, it just pretty much goes quiet. It goes silent after the age of 12. What we do know about that time is that he was a carpenter during these early periods or, you know, when he started to, to grow into an adult. He worked with his father, Joseph, in his carpenter shop, and we do know he was doing that, but we don't know a lot about it. And where this is going on is in Nazareth, we're told. Nazareth is up here in Galilee, And Jerusalem and Judea, where you hear so much of what is going on in the scriptures, takes place down here. This is Judea. Jerusalem is right here. And then Samaria is in between. They didn't get along with the Samaritans and you know some of those stories probably also. But much of Jesus' ministry takes place up in Galilee and his hometown is Nazareth. He makes his way down to this baptismal site down here um, near Judea, which is where Jesus' baptism almost certainly took place. We don't know with 100% certainty that that's where it was, but he makes his way down for that. But he grew up in this town of Nazareth. It was not a prestigious city. It was not a place that you would have been proud to be from. Think Cleveland right? That's the sort of place that that Nazareth is. But this is where Jesus is from, and he comes on the scene, and he is baptized there by John. It wasn't a powerful place. The highly regarded folks were in Jerusalem. That's where they set up. This is where all the power was. This is where the capital was, essentially. And so Jesus was from a very different place. So when people would hear, yeah, Jesus, he's he's from Nazareth, people would be like, Oh, we're kind of disappointed about that fact. So, not celebrated place, not a celebrated status. He lived in a very ordinary place. He came to be and fit in sort of as an ordinary person. And that's how he lived those first 30 years of his life before his baptism really comes and takes him to a different place place. But that's why he comes. He came to be like us. And as we go on then in the text, we can see some ways, some other ways in which he's very much like us, where there are a lot of parallels between who we are and who Jesus is. And one of those is seen in his baptism. Jesus is like us in his baptism. Last week we saw that John the Baptist baptized thousands and thousands of ordinary people. They came out to him for a baptism (coughs) of repentance. And that was awesome for them, but it kind of raises a red flag when you think about Jesus, that Jesus is coming for a baptism of repentance because Jesus doesn't have anything to repent of. He lived a perfectly sinless life, but yet he is coming out for this baptism of repentance. It doesn't seem to make any 
since. Matthew, in fact, even records that, that John the Baptist resisted baptizing Jesus. He says, you ought to be baptizing me instead of the other way around. But Jesus insists, why? Why does Jesus insist that he would participate in this baptism of repentance when he doesn't need it? And the reason is because Jesus came into our world to identify with mankind, to identify with you and me, to be like us. That's why he entered into our world. It's no more out of place that a sinless Jesus would go through a baptism of repentance than that a sinless Jesus would go to the cross and die for the sins of mankind. It's really very much the same thing. He comes to identify with us, to represent us. Imagine that the time came when it was time to, to get some, someone to represent Western Pennsylvania, maybe in Harrisburg or somewhere else, doesn't matter, but uh, we're looking for somebody to represent us. And there are two options. One of them is from center. The other one is from Iceland. The person from Iceland has never been to the U.S., but they've read about it on the internet. So which one of them is going to be better equipped to represent us? Well, it's obvious. It's going to be the person who knows what it means to, to read up someplace and has been downtown a time or two, right? Yeah, those are, that's the person that you're going to want to rep, have represent you because they know something about you. They know something about the context. They're better, a better representative. And so that's why Jesus comes. Jesus comes so that he might enter into our world, enter into our circumstance, and as he does so, he becomes the perfect representative for us in the world. He is like us in that way. He is like us in his baptism. As Mark goes on, we come to understand that he's also like us in the Spirit. Mark continues in verse 10, look at it. It says, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. This is a beautiful picture of, of God opening up the heavens and the Spirit of God descending gently on Jesus, anointing him for the ministry that he is going to do. And Jesus understood that this is what his role was to be. In fact, he will later take the words of Isaiah and apply them to himself. They are these words, that the Spirit of the Lord, Jesus is saying, is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, the descending of the Spirit seems like kind of an otherworldly sort of experience or activity, and in many ways it was, but in many ways it is just like us because that very same Spirit that descended on Jesus is the same one that has descended on everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ. And if you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus, that same Spirit that descended like a dove has already descended upon you and is indwelling your life. And you can understand that. That's a promise that we have received. The Apostle Paul points out to us this, that in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The Spirit is your connection to God. He is the one who lives within. He is the one who indwells you, and he wants you to draw on it. Why else would he give it if it wasn't for us to draw on and to use? So much of what God chooses to do in this world, he, he chooses to use his people to get done. And because he has placed his spirit on us when we do something on behalf of Christ, we're not just bringing our own ability to bear on that circumstance. We're bringing, if we will submit to it, the power of God's Spirit. We're bringing the words of Jesus. We're bringing the, the intention of God into that circumstance. So it's much more than just what we on our own might be able to accomplish. We're accomplishing God's work, not just our work in that situation. We are like Jesus in the Spirit. And then one other way that we are like Jesus or that Jesus is like us is in his testing. In his testing. Jesus' testing or his temptation, as it's talked about here, is recorded for us in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which taken together form what we talked about last week, the what Gospels. You remember? Synoptic Gospels. That's it. 
the synoptic gospels. It just means that they are in common or they have much that is in common with one another. And Mark's account is by far the shortest of the three different accounts. It's just two verses. He comes here in verse 12 and 13, which say this, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now you might think that after Jesus' very special baptism that there would have been some special celebration, right? Jesus comes out of the water. Let's celebrate. Let's, let's commemorate that. You would think at least maybe a trip to Brewster's or something. But there's none of that here. There's no celebration after it all. Instead, what Mark says, he uses one of his favorite words, and you'll see it repeatedly in this book, immediately. He says immediately that Jesus was driven out into the wilderness, that he was driven out to be tempted, really is what's happening. Jesus doesn't accidentally find himself in the wilderness to be tempted and and tested because somehow he just ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's intended that he would be there. He's driven out, and not by some evil spirit, but by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one who sends Jesus out. And you kind of have to ask why. It's kind of puzzling why that would be the case. Certainly, the Spirit is working in harmony with the will of God the Father, the purposes of the Father. So why send Jesus off into the wilderness? Why not instead have Jesus come up out of the water and the Spirit descends and it's beautiful what's happening and he steps out of the water and there's a lame man and so he heals him. Why not that? That's not what happens. And the reason is because that there is a purpose for the wilderness. The wilderness is a time of preparation. It's a time to learn and, and grow and focus your heart and mind on the essentials for the future ahead. And there were many times that in the scriptures we find that God actually uses 40 days for preparation. If you think about it, There were several. It was it was forty days of rain during the flood. It was forty days that Jesus, or excuse me, that Moses was on Mount Sinai meeting together with God. It was forty days that Elijah had his own journey through the wilderness. It's 40 days that Goliath comes out against the Israelites and he taunts them over and over and he's just laying them out and they're cowering in their fear and they don't know what to do. They're in their wilderness. God is doing a work to prepare them because eventually what happens? David steps up. David steps up full of faith and ready to give God all of the glory and steps up and defeats Goliath. And what sort of a a message, what sort of a promise do you think that that would have provided for the people of Israel to see, we were so fearful, we did not know what to do. And then God stepped in. It was a time of preparation for them in the wilderness. Do you think that that made a difference for them going forward the next time that they recognized that we're in a world of hurt here, we need some help? Who could help us? Oh, God, he's helped us in the past. It's a time of preparation. And it is for Jesus as well. There are all sorts of challenges that Jesus was going to encounter. And as one who has entered into our world, having the fullness of humanity, it wasn't just kind of like we are, having the fullness of humanity, he wasn't exempt from fear. He wasn't exempt from doubt creeping in. He could have given in to that had he chosen, but he didn't. So the wilderness experience is a valuable time to to fully set your mind on the power of the Spirit working through you. And we need to to experience and we need to understand the bond that we have with Jesus in his testing. We're like him. He's like us in that way. We didn't just have some bad luck and that's why you ended up in the place of trial, in a place of difficulty. If you're in a place of difficulty, It's because there is an opportunity there for you to learn and to grow and to be prepared. Every wilderness is a place of preparation if we're willing to submit ourselves to it. So whatever it is that you're going through, understand this is an opportunity. This is not just something to be run from. It's something to learn from. We see in Jesus that the Spirit actually drove him out to prepare him 
And I believe that the wilderness journeys that we experience are intended to prepare us as well if we'll soften ourselves to it. We are like Jesus in that way. There's a union, there's a bond that we have in His baptism, in the Spirit, in His testing. We are like Him. We can learn from what He did in those same circumstances. But that's not the only thing. There's another thing that we can learn through his baptism, through his, through his testing, through the inauguration of his ministry, and it is this, that Jesus is set apart. That Jesus is set apart. In one sense, he's like us. In another sense, he's not like us at all. He rises way above where we find ourselves. When Jesus is baptized and the heavens are torn open and the, spirits, the Spirit descends, it's accompanied by a declaration of this fact that Jesus is set apart. And we see it in a couple of ways. One, he is set apart in the Father's blessing. This is abundantly clear when you look at what Mark records for us here in verse 11. Look at it, he wrote, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. If you had been there to hear that, you see the heavens torn open and the spirit descending in the Father's voice, you are my beloved Son, you would have just stood in awe. You'd have just wondered what is going on. You might have fallen on the ground, prostrate to worship, to praise. I'm not sure what all you would have done. This is, this is a ringing endorsement that is coming from heaven on Jesus for who he is and in what he's to do. Now, this is not when Jesus becomes the Son of God. This is an acknowledgement that Jesus has always been the Son of God. And it's an acknowledgement that will benefit anybody who's listening in. But it's not just a ringing endorsement of Jesus for their sake. In fact, I don't even believe it's primarily for their sake. Look at what Jesus, or excuse me, what God the Father says. He doesn't say, as though announcing to everybody, this is my son whom I love. That's not what he says. What he says, he directs straight to Jesus. He says, you are my beloved son. Not this is my beloved, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. These are intimate words of love and affirmation that God the Father gives directly to Jesus to prepare him for what is to come. The blessing of the Father sets Jesus apart for the fact that he is wholly other than what we are is what we can see here. It's also an interesting benefit to us because what we discover in this is the idea of the Trinity. Now the word Trinity is not actually in the Bible, but the concept is all over it, which is simply the idea that there is one God one essence that is God. But he's manifest in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you see all of them active right here. If you ever need to point out to somebody that there are three members of the Godhead and to show that they're all distinct, you can point them straight to this passage, straight to Jesus' baptism. Because you have God the Father speaking from heaven, you have God the Son being baptized, and you have God the Holy Spirit who is descending from heaven upon Jesus, three in one. So we see Jesus set apart in the Father's blessing, which is really awesome. <laughs> and then one more way as well. When Jesus goes out into the wilderness for these 40 days, we know that Satan is there and he is trying to tempt Jesus to sin. Now Mark, for his part, doesn't seem to think it's important or necessary that he would mention the specifics of exactly what those different areas of temptation were. If you want to find those, you can go to the parallel passages, which are in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, and you can read those passages, and you can read specifically what the different temptations were. Mark, for his part, doesn't seem to think that that's necessary in order to make his point, so he doesn't go into all of that detail. He doesn't do that, and for what he's trying to say, he doesn't need to 
focus on those things. That's apparently also what the writer of Hebrews wants us to focus on as he identifies Jesus as being the great high priest. And he says of of him this, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Clearly, we also see Jesus set apart not just in the Father's endorsement or blessing, but also in his sinlessness. In his sinlessness is the other way. Now, there are some who suggest that Jesus' sinlessness is not all that big of a deal because after all, he's God. And so it's easy for him to overcome and and the temptations wouldn't have been all all that tempting. But that's simply not true. The writer of Hebrews probably thought or had heard that argument or maybe thought of that argument himself. And so he sort of preempts it here when he tells us what he's told us, that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. That doesn't mean tempted just in the different categories that we're tempted. It also means tempted to the degree that we are tempted. In fact, it would seem to suggest in the passage that Jesus is perhaps tempted even to a degree beyond what we're tempted with. Because Satan is right there, and you can bet that Satan knows exactly the consequences if Jesus were to actually give in to one of these temptations. This is a big, big deal. So how is it that Jesus is able to overcome? Well, we've already talked about one of those factors, which is for us as well, and that is because of the Spirit's presence. This is one of the things that benefits Jesus to overcome the sin that he is being tempted to commit. It is no accident that the temptation of Jesus comes after his baptism, comes after the Spirit of God descending on him, comes after the Father's words, of affirmation because Jesus is prepared through those things to face the circumstances that he is facing now as he is out in the wilderness. Those things would prepare Jesus to face the intensity of all of that and we should learn something from that because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, as we've said, the Spirit of God has already descended on you. You going into your temptation is coming after you have also been given the power and those things that are necessary to help you and to assist you in overcoming it. You've been equipped. You're not some victim that has just fallen, you know, into this circumstance and you didn't have any way around it or through it or over it because you've been prepared just as Jesus was prepared for facing the circumstances that come your way. But we need to submit to it. See, one of the temptations that we face as 21st century Americans is self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. We have bought into this, I can do it myself motto, and we live by it. When our kids were younger, growing up, we used to read all the time to them so many different stories. One of their favorite books was one called, I Can Do It Myself. I can do it, some of you probably know the book. I can do it myself. And it was basically about helping kids get confidence to do things that they never had done before and setting them up for success in that way. But it seemed as though my girls only learned the title and they would apply it in all the wrong places. And so we're in a big hurry to get out the door somewhere and and they're trying to put on their shoes and I just take them and it's like, here, let me get those on for you quick. And they're like, dad, I can do it myself. Or we'd be at the, the kitchen sink and one of them is trying to help out and, and all they're doing is getting soap suds on themselves and, and, on the, and on the counter and on the floor and everywhere except on the dishes. And I step in and I try to take the brush away from them and I, or the washcloth and I try to step in and do it for them and they're like, Dad, I can... That's right. You know it. You know it. I can do it myself. And it always seemed to have just a little bit of an attitude. Now, as some of you know, I'm about to be a grandpa, but I'm not quite there yet. And so maybe some of you can help me out. Is it wrong for me to buy that book for my grandchild and give it to my grandchild just as a way to get revenge on my own kids? Is that wrong? No, that's okay? All right, good. I'm glad to know that. Thank you for the help. Yeah, all right. I can do it myself. Unfortunately, that is a mindset that most of us take all the way into adulthood. And we live it out. 
and we're still living it out. I can do it myself. When was the last time that you prayed, God, I'm empty? I don't have the wisdom to move forward. I need your leading to guide me in the way that you would have me to go. It requires a humility that is oftentimes beyond our comprehension. And how many times do we say to God, by our choice to not engage, to not get in the Word, to not submit to the Spirit, how many times are we just saying, I can do it myself? Thank you very much, but I've got this. And as a result, we put ourselves in a place we're susceptible to falling into sin because we haven't received the preparation that God has provided. Bottom line is we need to admit our weakness before we can access his strength. But it's so hard to do. Jesus is set apart in his sinlessness because he drew on the power of the Spirit, because he drew on also the scriptures. That's another key as well. If you do check out Jesus' temptation in Matthew and in Luke where he says here are the specific things that he was tempted with, Jesus responded to those temptations by quoting the scriptures, by applying the scriptures into those circumstances. The scriptures are that powerful. They are a mighty weapon in our arsenal if we will take and use them. The psalmist says this, says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The wilderness, I understand, can feel like a very lonely place. But what you need to understand is when you're in the wilderness, you're never alone. Think about Israel. Israel who ended up in the wilderness because of their own sin, because of their own rebellion. They deserved to be going through the things they went through, not for 40 days, for 40 years. But God even then didn't desert them. He led them through the pillar of fire and the cloud. He fed them with the manna. He provided water for them as it was needed. God never abandons anyone in the wilderness, and he hasn't deserted you, and he never will. That's simply what we need to understand. Instead, he is there with us to teach us, to train us, to equip us for navigating life as it comes. All of Jesus' experience in the wilderness perfectly prepared him for what was ahead. He's about to walk into the most challenging, yet rewarding circumstances of his whole life here on this earth. And all of it leads me to just wonder, what has God, what has God been preparing you to do through your wilderness? You've been through it. You might be going through it. And if he never abandons us, what is it that he has trained you already to do through the circumstances of your life, of your experience? There's something there. Maybe you didn't feel particularly inclined to, to lean into discovering what that was, but there still was a lesson. And I don't believe it's too late to learn what that lesson is, or certainly as we move forward, certainly as you walk through the hardship that might come your way, to learn to understand what it is that God is doing, how it is that he's preparing you for facing not just that situation, but others that are to come, and even taking on a ministry through that of assisting others as they walk through their own wilderness, as they walk through their own pain, their own hardship. And if we'll submit to his leading, we can be drawn to that understanding. We can be guided by the Spirit. The essential Jesus is twofold. And without both, we're left empty. It is the fact that Jesus is with us. Jesus is like us, coming into our world to become fully human, 
so that he might be an appropriate representative for us going to the cross. But Jesus is also beyond us. Jesus is also set apart, sinless, to be able to be the spotless Lamb of God, sacrificed for our sin. Both sides are the essential Jesus, and both sides are, well, essential, indispensable, so that we might see Him and know Him. Mark wants to make sure that we get that right from the start because it shapes the whole of this gospel and it shapes our hope as well. So right from the start, we see who Jesus is, that He loves us so much that He enters in so that we might have victory over our sin. Yet He's beyond us to the degree that He, as He goes to the cross, is not just an appropriate representative, but he had the, has the power in him because of his sinlessness to take our sin to the cross with him. And we can be so very grateful for the essential Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? You might be here today, you might be listening today as one who's like, yeah, that's, that's really awesome, but... I'm not so sure that the Spirit has descended on me, that I have all of this ability because I'm I'm not so sure that I've ever really put my faith in Jesus. In fact, you might be here to say, I know that I have never put my faith in Jesus. But today you want to change that. You can, right here, right now. Just a matter of confessing your sin, asking God for His forgiveness, and putting your trust in Him for what He has done for you, that you might have hope and that you might have life. I can help you with that. It's it's simply a matter of telling God that that's what you desire to do, communicating that to Him. If, If you don't have your own words, you could use words similar to these, just communicating to God something like, Dear God, Thank you for your love that sent Jesus. You didn't stay far away, but you entered in so that we might know you, so that you might be able to identify with me and you know me clearly, who I am, where I am. Father, today I confess that sin. Today I ask you for your forgiveness. And today, I choose to put my faith and my trust in you so that I can have that hope, that assurance of eternal life. Thank you that Jesus is is like me so that he could relate, but he is beyond me so that he could die for my sin. I receive that gift now. Thank you for it. Friend, if that's what you have prayed, if this is the first time that you have taken that step, then what you can picture for yourself in this moment is is the heavens opening and the Spirit of God descending upon you into your life to indwell your life, to give you the power of Christ, to give you the power to overcome the temptation that comes your way, just as Jesus did. Friend, if you're here and that's the decision you've made, then then tell me after this service. Would you tell me after this service? Also put on that Connect card, you're going to turn it in a moment, that you trusted Jesus. You can turn that in as well. But I would love to know. I'd be so encouraged to know of the step that you have taken. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the blessing we have in Jesus, who came to be like us, but is also set apart. We pray that as we worship, as we go, that that reality would fill our hearts, that we would go with confidence, 
that we have the power to overcome. And even when we face our trial, and even when we face our challenge, even when we face our wilderness, that you are right there with us. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand and sing with us and take this opportunity to once again surrender our hearts fully to the Lord. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall. Thank you so much for being here today. If you'd like to come forward and receive prayer with someone, you can do that now. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next weekend.